Welcome back, scoundrels, to Weird Wolf Unchained, where we talk about horror and horror movies and stuff. I am Bran. I'm Lynn. And we are finishing up our conversation about The Invisible Man. Um, the first part was an interview to see if a conversation could be had between the two. If he only watched the movie and I only read the book. Yes. That's that's the distinction. I'm reading the movie, reading, <laughs> watching. You did that earlier when we were talking about this. Did I? I watched the movie and Lynn read the book and that's the only media we consumed for it. I have recently watched the 2020 Invisible Man, but that's not the one we compared it to. We compared it to the 1933 version because I don't think, mm, excuse me. It's not so modern that I think a lot of the stuff or I thought a lot of the stuff would be lost. Not having ever read the book, so I don't know anything about it. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> I'm rambling on. You are. Um. Anyways, so go listen to the interview part um, to see if that passed or failed our test. Um, that's a work in progress. We're going to come up with some maybe better questions to what we're trying to accomplish here. Um, so keep an eye out on that, ear out, whichever. Um, let's get on. This is the summary and where we actually talk about the comparisons between the two. So let's start off with the characters. So I've got Jack Griffin, the main character. I also have Griffin. The main character. And little, I have listened to a little bit of stuff with the Invisible, well, the Invisible Man 2020 review from Dead Meat. And they talked a little bit about it. Um, the differences between the books and the movies. And in the book, is he's just known as Griffin, right? Yes. Whereas I think all the other adaptations, he's given a first name. Maybe even a last name in some, I don't know. <laughs> But um, then I have Kemp in the movie is a close proximity workplace associate acquaintance. Um, that's kind of all the further back there detail goes in the movie. And yeah, you get the feeling that they're not necessarily real close, but close enough, I guess. Uh, I also have Kemp. A scientist and old school chum who he accidentally runs into while on the run. Um, my next set are the end folks who get a name in like their last scene, which is Mr. and Mrs. Hill. Have Mr. and Mrs. Hall, Mrs. Hall, the or innkeeper, maybe it's Hall. I don't and remember. Mr. Hall, the coachman. Hmm. Whereas it's not really established, I think, because of the way things play out. We've already kind of talked about that in the interview that those roles are reversed a little bit, that she's in charge of housekeeping, but she, and she does do it herself a little bit, but she's more like a hostess. The inn is hers and Mr. Hall has no say. And that's why Griffin gets to stay as long as he does. Cause Hall would have tossed him out sooner, but her delicate feminine sensibilities. So anyways, then you have Flora. Nope. Griffin's fiance. Nope. And no, Science Dad, who is Flora's dad, and Dr. Kemp and Griffin both work for him. Yep. I don't cut that guy either. Stop telling me I have guys I don't have. I'm not. You have Cuss, the GP. Please. General practitioner. He's a doctor. Oh. The medical man. Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Bunting. The vicar and his wife. And Marvel, the tramp. Which, I'm sure those characters are there. They're just background characters and their names don't matter in the movie. So, anyways. Marvel isn't a background character. He, uh, in the movie. I don't even know if there's necessarily a specific there isn't really a specific tramp it's just there's possibly a tramp 
So, I don't know. Nobody really did anything that stood out beyond these main characters. And I only call him Science Dad because they say his name at some point near the end. Again, one of his last couple times on screen. So, like, if you can't give the character a name in the beginning, I'm not going to care about him. And that's usually a sign that somebody's going to die, but they don't. <laughs> Spoiler alert. Which, um, yeah, this is definitely going to be spoilery. Um... 87 year old movie and 100 and some odd year old 23 23 year old wow combined that is 110 years or 210 years how do we get less when my book's 123 years old because <laughs> i forgot to add <laughs> <laughs> anyways so uh in the movie we start with griffin walking in the snow um Comes across a sign, tells him where to go, and he goes to the Lion's Head Inn, I believe it's called in the movie. The Coach and Horse. And when he gets there, he asks for a room, but they don't normally have travelers in the winter, so they don't have anything ready. But he insists, quote unquote, that they ready one for him anyways. So... That's the first sign for the movie of him being um, not of normal action compared to how everyone else around him is. Like you're supposed to be under the impression that everybody's just generally gleeful and jolly and nice to each other all the time. Of course. So his actions are out of place. And it's not so much so that he's being mean or anything. He's just, you will go do this now because I said so. Is that comparable to you in any way? Uh, he does arrive at the inn, the coach and horse. Uh, he requires a room that they have to make ready for him. So, yes, and a parlor for his own private use. Oh, yeah. He does ask for, I think it's called the sitting room in the movie, which could just be a difference of where it's done and... Time period. I mean, 1833, when was the book written? Uh, 1897. So it's 26-year difference, give or take, I think. No, 40, 46-year difference. So could just be, you know, those things. That's not a big deal. Um, so... Wife uh, brings him up to his room and says, I'll bring you some dinner. Comes back down, gets his dinner stuff, brings it back up. And in these little interactions here, he's very curt and straightforward with her. This is what I want. Leave me the hell alone. Um... And then he kind of realizes that he's being a little too forward with his stuff. So he kind of tries to walk it back a little bit, which is interesting. Uh, I forget exactly what he says there, but he, he turns around. And he starts being nicer to her when they're face to face, so to speak, because he's wrapped up in bandages. Then here I have, she brings the dinner back up and she... The mustard was forgot to be put on the tray, so she has to bring it back up, and she sees briefly that she can't see him because he has to pull the bandages down over from his face so he can eat. And he has one of his angry outbursts, I told you not to disturb me, blah, 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 blah. And I just made a note here uh, that for 1933, the effects were pretty neat and done really well. Oh! That's something I forgot in the interview. That was one of the things, like, because of the time period and how well the effects are done, um, that it's actually very unsettling to see it on screen. Because you do have a man walking around in pajamas, and you only see the pajamas moving around. And you can see everything behind him perfectly fine. It's, it, it's really cool. 
And I read a little something that uh, he wore a black velvet suit for the parts that are supposed to be invisible and filmed his parts in front of a black velvet screen. And then they just transposed it over. Like or, green screen. Yeah. Yep. But a lot better. It looks way better. <laughs> um, You got anything on that? Uh... No, it's kind of the same. Uh, she's bringing him dinner and comes in unannounced and he's holding a uh, serviette in front of his face, but he doesn't have it up fast enough because he didn't expect her to come in. And she just assumes that he's got a really wide mouth and she keeps justifying it like he doesn't have his glasses on. And it looks he said it looked like his eyes were must have been really sunk in because it was just all dark. Probably just a trick of the light. Yeah. See, so he still has his glasses on, and he's eating, he's got his bandages down, and he pulls the napkin up real quick and holds it like this. Like this? Yes. <laughs> I'm aware. <laughs> um, it's just covering his face. He just holds a napkin up over his face to hide the fact that you can't see. Um, she doesn't really try to explain. She just... Uh, see that... she say? He was mean and was unnatural or something they don't go into detail this is this is the part where that kind of plays on her feminine sensibilities i guess because she assumes because he's got the serviette in front of his face that he was injured in some way and that explains the bandages and he's ashamed of it and she feels bad for him but then he gets snippy and she's like oh but you're being that man but then also, you know, it's cold and he's tired and maybe he's in pain. He did ask me to leave him alone. Yeah, it's a back and forth on she, you know, he's frustrating because he's rude, but also he's probably hurt. Maybe in pain or something. Yeah, trying to figure out what's wrong with him. Yeah, you definitely don't get that. Um, this part of the movie definitely plays or tries to play on the comedic elements a lot more. Um it's a little difficult to deal with almost a hundred years later because our acting chops are much better now. Although there's still some people who act just like this in blockbuster rated movies. So <laughs> take that with some salt. <laughs> um, then in the movie, we cut to Flora, who is talking to her father about Jack going off or Griffin, if you will. Uh, we learned it's been a month since he was left and that Jack started changing before he left. Like his attitude and mannerism started changing. And then Kemp comes into the room and he's trying to help. Like, no, he wanted to be left alone. Just leave it be. He'll come back when he's ready. And then he follows Flora. She runs into the next room crying He's like, don't worry about him. I'm here for you. I could be your man because he wants to smell the flowers. Yeah. <laughs> nope. None of that. None of that at all. Uh, he just waits for the arrivals of his goods to set up his laboratory in the parlor. And then just starts making smashy noises and frustrated yellings and all kinds of things. And then there's townsfolk coming in at various points, the clock fixer, the constable coming in to investigate just the bottles because they're weird and different allusions to his invisibility. Uh, he didn't have his gloves on, so there was no hand. So the clockmaker, I think, possibly the constable. Maybe the vicar. I don't know. Interchangeable village character assumed that part of his injury, that the bandaging is he lost his arm. But then how does the sleeve keep its shape like that? Because he doesn't see anything how is the up, bottle able to move? up the sleeve. He's not holding anything. Oh. It's just his arm, but he's kind of still moving it. How is it able to do that if he's got a cork arm? Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, there's none of that in mind. Uh, it alludes to it a little bit later and on. That's when the villagers start questioning thingies. Because mine comes back to Griffin and 
Uh, the wife brings him up lunch. And he's like, leave me the hell alone, woman. Well, he doesn't say woman, but he's just, leave me alone. I you know, don't want to be bothered. I'm doing very important work in here. And she's like, but it's lunchtime. And this is when we told you we'd bring you lunch. To bring you lunch this time every day. And he's like, I don't want it. And he opens the door and slams the tray down. And she runs off back down the st- stairs. She runs off back down the stairs, screeching her head off. And she goes and talks to Mr. Hall or Hill or the innkeeper man and uh, tells him that she wants Griffin out because he's rude and he hasn't paid for over a week and he's ruining their room with his experiments because he's spilling liquids everywhere and smashing stuff and then we go the 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 scene goes up before Mr. Hall goes up and Griffin's up there and then we see him throwing stuff and he's like ah oh, stupid ignorant ru- woman ruined a good day's work cuz must have startled him or something while he was trying to we don't see what happened but um then Mr. Hill's there and uh Griffin I have Jack written down so I'm trying to remember to call him Griffin Griffin starts being nice to the innkeeper. He's like, no, I'm just working and you got to let me stay. Uh, I've got money on the way. And he's like, you said that last week. Nothing showed up. You've upset my wife. She said, if you don't go, she is. So you need to get your stuff. I'll help you pack up, but you can't stay here anymore. And then Griffin attacks him with a book and knocks him down the stairs. And then the police are called. Somehow. So kind of big book too. Kind of similar there. He's is spilling stuff on the carpet and everything, and he's just saying, add it to my bill, add it to my bill. And everyone's starting to ask questions, and Mrs. Hall's just answering them as she can or making stuff up because he says he's an experimental investigator. So she's Whatever that means. Yeah. Whatever that means. And she kind of keeps letting him do it up until the point that he's not paying anymore. And that's when he goes and he robs the vicar's house, but he doesn't get caught doing it. He gets back and um, she doesn't bring his lunch and he gets mad and hungry and says, why didn't you bring my lunch? She says, I'll bring your lunch when you pay your bill. And he says, I've got money on the way. And she says, you said that last week, last week. And he says, I've got some money now. And she says, and I bet it's the same amount that the vicar lost. And see, like, uh, what's your time period? And what's my time period? Does it does it give a time frame for how long things are going on there? Because like I said, in mine, when we're talking, when we see Flora and her father, it's um, a month has passed, but we don't know at what point they are. And given 1930s, I'm assuming travel is a little bit longer. So. Yeah, by coach in the snow. And we don't see that. He's walking in the snow. So. And he's definitely in the country because he calls them bumpkins. And I was just curious. I don't think it re- it really, as far as the story goes, doesn't really make that big of an importance. But we only talk about a couple weeks in mine. So. I'm assuming a couple weeks of travel and a couple weeks there. Okay. Um, do you have anything else for your, your side of this? Uh, so why isn't my bill paid? And that's when uh, the constable comes in and they have a little scuffer, scuffer, scuffle. And he takes off his bandages. And this is when people freak out because, you know, he's the headless man. And then they're trying to fight him and hold him. Uh, the uh, the constable, random villager guy, and everyone, they're trying to hold him while he's trying to take his clothes off while they're fighting him. And then he's invisible and runs away because he gets all his clothes off. Um, so police show up after Mrs. Innkeeper is screeching her head off. And... The constable and a whole bunch of villagers go upstairs to confront him. And he shows them his secret. 
because he takes off his fake nose at first. He's like, here's a souvenir for you. He starts on bandaging, or, and he takes his glasses off so, like, you can see that there's nothing there. Yeah. Like, again, a place where for 1930s, these effects are incredible. Like, you would just expect maybe black velvet behind it, which is kind of what they do the first time you get a glimpse at it. But, no, like, you can see through to the bandages behind. It's kind of neat. And he's ripping it off and takes his wig off. And here's the souvenir for you, too. And he's like, ha, 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 madman laughing. I am invisible. He doesn't actually say that, but. Um, he does say, I'm the invisible man when he takes his head off. And uh, the constable and all the villagers freak out. Some of them run completely out of the building. The constable just goes downstairs and he's, he's invisible. Oh, if he takes off all his clothes, he'll be able to get away. So they run back up the stairs. <laughs> <laughs> and then we come, when we see Jack or Griffin upstairs, he's just got his shirt on because he's taking everything else off already. And somehow, like, he's scuffling with a couple people and he loses his shirt. And then he starts throwing things and messing with the other villagers and they run off. And then he grabs the constable and starts choking him. But not all the way. And he runs off and smashes a bunch of stuff. And he gets down and he smashes the clock down on the ground. And he's smashing all the cups in the bar. And... Then he just runs through town, taking people's stuff and knocking things off of people and running into them. And he steals a man's bike, but then gives it back to him. <laughs> yeah, it's weird. So he doesn't choke the constable, but he does concuss him because he tosses him out into the street, barreling through the door. And then he runs away. And then this is where he meets the tramp Marvel, because out on the road, uh, Marvel's sitting, talking to himself about a pair of boots and Griffin starts talking to him, and Marvel thinks he's going crazy because he's hearing a voice. And then the voice says, I'm real. And he says, well, show yourself. This is right here. So uh, Griffin starts chucking rocks at him until he admits that he's really there. And then he says that we're both, Griffin says to the tramp, uh, we're both outcasts, you and I. I need your help, and then you'll be in my debt. How great would it be to have an invisible man in your debt? And he convinces Marvel to go back to the village to go to the inn because he needs his uh, three books that have his recipe for invisibility in them. So Marvel goes back to the inn and he's nervous and shifty looking and a random villager who I didn't even write down his name sees him being shifty and kind of watches him go into the inn, and when he goes into the inn, he opens what was Griffin's private parlor door, but the GP and the vicar are in there investigating all his science-y stuff. Yeah. And they come up to the I door. I say something instead of just nodding my head at you. <laughs> <laughs> open the door, and he's like, oh, this, this isn't the right way. And he says, oh, sorry, I thought this was... He says, no, it's that way. But while he's got the door open, that's when mm. Griffin sneaks into the room to get his books. And Marvel goes and has a quick drink and then comes out and stands shifty at the side of the inn. And the one guy watches him be shifty. Meanwhile, inside the room, Griffin's in there and he tells uh, Cuss and Bunting, don't say anything or I'll brain you both. And he gets his book and he makes the vicar take his clothes off and steals his clothes. And he wads them up together and he tosses them out the window to the tramp. And the guy watching him be shifty yells, stop thief. Because he's stealing stuff from the inn. Mm -hmm. And they start and he starts chasing them. And uh, another villager joins in. And that's when Griffin comes out the window and starts beating him. So they're now yeah, fighting. Sorry, I was I was thinking about something. Fighting the invisible man and the half partially naked uh, vicar and GP come out and go. He's out there. He's invisible. Catch him! Catch him! But him and the tramp both get away, and they start to notify, send their story on to villages down the way, the direction the tramp went to watch for the invisible man. Yeah. Nice. Which I'm sure is what happened in the movie. Oh, yeah. Let's talk about that. You're going to have to give me a moment. 
to catch up to you. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It was only one chapter. So Kemp and Science Dad are searching Jack's laboratory for her clues. Even though they said nothing was down there earlier other than a pile of burned papers in the uh, wherever, because they don't really say where. But uh, he did actually leave a list of chemicals with monocaine, is what it's called, down at the bottom. They don't list any of the other chemicals or anything. It's just the monocaine. But that's the important one. Of course. And we get some exposition from Science Dad. Uh, if you've listened to the interview part, like I said, this part of the reason why I call him Science Dad is to emphasize his lack of importance in the story. Because all he does is exposition dump. And he gives a brief explanation of how he found this information on Monocrane that they first tested it on cloth to bleach it and it ruined the cloth. doesn't say how that would be an interesting fact to know. <laughs> um, then they tested it on a dog and it made the dog look albino or whatever bleached it, but it also made it go mad or some kind of animal. I don't, they may have said dog. I don't exactly remember, but the dog went mad. And he's like, Oh, if he's been using this, he's probably going mad too. That would explain some of his eccentricities right before he left and stuff. And then uh, Kemp's like, we need to go to the police and let them know what's going on. He's like, promise me you won't tell the police. This is where I was asking you about the plot thing. Um, because it's it's to set up for later for other things to happen. Because if you just go to the police now and tell them, hey, there's this invisible man who's running around, then we can start to search earlier. Then we go to a little bit later in the day. Kemp is listening to the radio about the attacks at the inn where there's an invisible man reported. Then Jack reveals that he's actually there with Kemp because he sought him out. And then he's like, hey, we're going to talk. But first, this is really uncomfortable for you, I'm sure. I need bandages and clothes and stuff so that way we can have a visible presence on the screen for the audience too, I'm sure. Of course. <laughs> And I forget exactly what happens there, but Jack threatens Kemp and I wrote down that he demonstrates his power, but I forget what that is offhand because they're just sitting there talking and he's like, Hey, I want to work together with you, but we need to go get my stuff or no, that's what he hasn't gotten his clothes yet. That's why I'm confused. He hasn't gotten his clothes yet and he's, Demonstrating to Jack how he can be anywhere, essentially. And, or not, and Kemp wouldn't know it. And so then we see Jack dressed and he tells Kemp his tale. And Kemp calls it ghastly, but Jack doesn't see it that way. And he insists that it's wondrous. And wonderful, or wonderful. One of those two. And Kemp is definitely, like, scared of this. And Jack tells his plans, or he, he kind of alludes to how he wants to rule the world and take control of things. But first, he wants to cause havoc and terror. A uh, misplaced cup, a murder here, a wreck train there. It's essentially what he says. But first, he has to get his notes. So Griffin and Kemp go to the inn. Um... Kemp just kind of hangs out outside. He's like, hey, just go over there and wander around like you're waiting for somebody. And he manages, or he just opens the door and walks in, but there's kids outside. And so Miss Hall's like, oh, you stupid kids, get out of here. Why you open the door? And they're like, but we didn't. She doesn't think anything of it, even though she was attacked by an invisible man earlier. And, you know, everybody's freaking out about it. But... There was kids there, so that explains it. And it must be something they do often. They use the ding and ditch approach for it, too, in the book. Um, but the kids are just hanging out there. They're watching. They're not ding and ditch. I know, but they, the characters but, always assume they were ding yeah. and ditching. Um, so he sneaks in, and he goes upstairs, and he gets his books, and he tosses them out to Kemp. And he goes back downstairs, and... Well, 
this is going on. Um, the kids were watching the cons, the chief constable, whatever. He's conducting interviews of people in town to figure out what's going on with the invisible man thing. And, uh, one guy is like, my hat blew off my head. And he's like, how many drinks did, have you had? Oh, I had a couple. Okay. So you're drinking and it was the wind next. And guys like my bike got pulled out for me and just rode off on its own. And I don't think uh, I missed, I might've just missed what he was saying about it. Cause I was just taking brief notes this time. And constable is just like, nope, I'm calling this a hoax. Y'all are just drunk and mad. And then he goes to sign off on his paper, what it is, what his findings are. And he's got an old timey pen that you have to dip in the ink pot. So Griffin starts moving the pot around so he can't dip it in. <laughs> and the, the uh, um, innkeeper's wife starts freaking out. She's like, oh, the invisible man is here. Sorry. <laughs> So it's well, and then he starts like dancing around on the table and then he goes over to the bar and starts throwing things at people. And then he kills the chief constable. So it's kind of like the book. I mean, Kemp acts in place of the tramp and we get an yeah. info dump about his past, which is still different than this. But later in the book and man, does he info dump? It comes from. Griffin himself, and he talks for 37 pages straight. Nice. Well, he's going to tell a story. He does have to tell his he's story. He's very proud of his story. He's a proud man. <laughs> it's his story within the story. So. But, so he and the Tramp are now moving together onto the new town, and the Tramp is starting to feel that this is less so much an invisible man being in his debt, and he's now being controlled by this invisible man. Because he keeps threatening him. Mm -hmm. And some guy in the new village sees him sitting on the hill by himself and comes up and sits next to him. And they're just casually talking. He's like, you hear this story about there being an invisible man. And Marvel, the tramp, starts to say, well, I know something about that. And he feels this hard pressure squeeze on his shoulder. And that's when he starts to get afraid. Yeah. And at some point, off, se off screen... He gets away from the Invisible Man and he's running in the next town and he's running and he runs into a pub and he says, bar the door, help me. He's after me, the Invisible Man, all this stuff. And he hides behind the counter and people have heard the story about the Invisible Man, but if you haven't really seen it and then the Invisible Man's there and he smashes the window to the pub and... He tries to get in, but uh, the constable or the barkeep has a gun and he shoots him. So Griffin gets shot and now he's not invisible anymore because he's bleeding. You can see the blood. Nice. So he flees and uh, Marvel begs to be locked up in the most secure cell they have. So Marvel and the books are locked up in a cell for Marvel's safety. And Griffin is running and he runs to this house outside town and he dings on the door. The maid opens it and says, ah, those kids. And while he's there, he sneaks in because the maid didn't notice the blood. But Kemp, maybe he got it. Right. Kemp, whose house it is, was upstairs and he's waiting for the maid to come tell him who's at the door and doesn't. Tries to work some more, can't, realizes he's hungry, goes downstairs, and he sees the blood on the floor. Is it dark out? I'm assuming it's nighttime. Because if it is, that could be part of the reason why she wouldn't see it. Because it's, yeah, they say it's a late hour, so yeah. So he goes upstairs to his room, and the door's open, and he didn't remember opening it, and he goes in, and there's just blood all over his bed. Ah, uh, cool. <laughs> And that is where Kemp re-meets Griffin. And they start talking. Griffin goes, Kemp, Kemp, it's you. And Kemp goes, the voice is out of nowhere. And he explains who he is. And Kemp asks for his story. And he says, by God's man, feed me and let me sleep. So he wraps a bandage around him so he's not really invisible anymore because he's now a floating bandage. And he puts on uh, Kemp's dressing gown. And 
he sleeps, and Kemp uses that opportunity to write a secret note to the constable, and he sends it out. And then in the morning, now we get uh, Griffin's backstory being told to Kemp while he tries to distract him, waiting for the constable to show up and take him. Okay. Are you... Oh. So, um, in the movie, Kempany... Kemp... Kempany? Kempany. <laughs> Kemp definitely uh, is kind of combined with Melville. Marvel. Marvel. Um, and the things that they do, because he acts a lot of the same ways that Marvel does, especially later on. Um, but this won't take as long for me to catch up. Uh, we go back to Kemp and they're at Kemp's house and Jack is explaining the rules about his invisibility that, uh, if it's, if he eats, he has to wait for an hour cause you can still see the food until it's digested, yep. which is kind of weird to me, but whatever. Same. It's because of the way he, the, what makes him invisible. It's the way lights reflect, reflected. It's like a piece of glass. Mm. it's explained in the book yeah it's not so much here um but like if he goes out in the rain you can see the raindrops hitting him same with same. snow same ash same he has to be mindful of footprints same and obviously blood mm. if he bleeds his own blood <laughs> and again the effects because he's in the pajamas again just kind of walking around as he's talking to Kemp and then he goes and lays down and it just, it is unnerving because it's just so good. So good. No, but they, they explain the invisibility is it's like a piece of glass and the way it either reflects or absorbs light, how you can see through it, but you can still see it's there. But if you submerge it in water, the light is broken up even more. So when it's submerged in water, you can't see it. But if you were to shatter it into dust, you can now see the glass more because it's, uh, each little piece is now multifaceted, yeah. so it's more visible. But if you then put that in water, it disappears entirely. Hmm. And that's how the invisibility works, like broken glass. Interesting. Um, do you want to go ahead and go with yours? Because mine's going to start, like, kicking up to the end. So Griffin gives him his backstory, how he got to be here. Uh, he explains that he was uh, living in the house and he was studying and he was keeping his research secret because if you publish something under another scientist, because he was a student at the time, the uh, upper scientist gets the credit for it and he didn't want to share the credit. So he's keeping it secret and working on it until he finished school. And then he's working on his own and he's setting up and he's doing this experiments in this house. And he finds this cat and he tries the experiment on the cat and he puts the cat on a pillow and does the invisibility experiment and the pillow disappears and most of the cat disappears except for its eyes. Nice. Its eyes don't disappear. Oh yeah, this would be fun. <laughs> you would hate it. <laughs> I would hate it. I would hate it very much. <laughs> Something about the pigment in cat eyes can't be treated with this. I suppose that makes sense. Experiment. So he lets the cat go and the cat belonged to the neighbor lady. And she's heard the cat meowing and she knows he's had it. And she thinks he's doing vivisection, which is illegal. So she tells the landlord that he's doing vivisection. So the landlord comes. But while she's dealing with all that, he yells at her and slams the door in the face and he does the experiment on himself. And he's slowly becoming invisible. And she comes to the door a couple times and sees him, you know, getting sicker, really, because he's just getting paler and he's an albino, so he's already really pale. And then by the time... And... and Oh, I forgot that part. While he's still going invisible, he boxes up his three journals with his notes and he mails them to a P.O. box because he's already destroying the evidence because now that she's complaining to the landlord, he won't be able to stay here and he's turning invisible. Yeah. And so the landlord and she show up and he's invisible and they're looking around for him and for proof of vivisection and all they see is these weird experiments and he's let the gas on. Ooh, nice. So he sneaks out while they search the room and then... 
he lights it up and just moves on. And he's out in the street, building on fire. He never thinks about it again. I want to I interject a couple things here. So Don't you interject eyes at me? Well, these have nothing to do with mine. Because, like I said, like, we kind of, like, this part, we really separate a lot. Um, Head nodding. <laughs> it just, this part of the store story sounds really familiar to, uh, what's it called? Herbert West Reanimator? No. Um, I think he's just called uh, Re Reanimator, um, which is based off of an HP Lovecraft. But, like... It sounds like there was a lot of influence that came out of this for the movie because the movie is way different than H.P. Lovecraft's story. It's actually closer to this. <laughs> <laughs> and um, you said in when we did the interview portion about this, it would kind of make a little bit of sense for him to fire and just walk away and not care about those people because they're evidence, too. True. <clears throat> so he gets out on the street, and this entire time he's been thinking about the great benefits of invisibility, but now he's on the street and people are bumping into him and he's leaving footprints because it's raining and the rain is showing and it's snowing because it's a slushiness. Yeah. And he's cold. Because his clothes aren't invisible. Because so his clothes aren't naked. invisible, so he's naked. And he almost gets knocked into the street and people are bumping into him and some of them are reacting weirdly to it, but most of them are just whatever busy street in London. I assume that's where Tottingham Court Road is. It sounds very British. Oh, it's definitely British. It's in Harry Potter. <sighs> well, then it must be in London. And this is all definitely set in England, but I'm, I'm thinking in London. London is not... Yeah. All, all of England is not all just London, is what I'm I saying. Know. And I think it's London. So uh, he goes into this ye olde department store and he's uh, going to hide there until they close is his plan and then get the things he needs to disguise himself as a person and then just walk out the door when they open. That doesn't go to plan. No, never does. Never does. Uh, he ends up with a fight in an invisible fight with one of the teenagers that work there. Ye olde teenagers. Clerk or something. Yeah. Or stuck boy or whatever. Ends up in a fight with him because they've noticed that he's ransacked the store because he wasn't exactly stealthy about it. Yeah. <laughs> he's just going around grabbing stuff and digging through stuff, looking for stuff that he wants. Things are just flying off shelves like there's a poltergeist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so he gets out and he's still naked in the cold street. So he thinks he'll go to this costumers because he still hasn't figured out what to do about his face. And he's like, I'll wear a mask. So he goes to where he knows the costumers are for the playhouse. And he goes to this man's shop and he dings the doorbell and the man opens it doesn't see anyone those darn kids and he gets in and he waits all day for the shop to close and he's realized that the man lives alone so to solve the problem of the man he just brains him ties him up in a bag and leaves him on the floor while he goes around and gets all the clothes he needs and gets a fake nose and a mask and bandages and Kemp interrupts him at this point and says, you just beat him? And he just, and Griffin responds. What else was I supposed to do? Exactly. <laughs> what else was I supposed to do? And Kemp goes, was he all right? He goes, I assume he was. I don't know. And goes but back. he owns a shop. I'm sure somebody came around at some point. Yeah, assuming he, you know, wasn't a deathly blow to the head. He didn't suffocate inside the bag he was tied in. All things possible. Yes. <laughs> but the point is, he didn't care. Yes. Is what this is setting up. That he didn't care that he burned down this building. He didn't care that he also assaulted this kid in the store to get away because he had to get away. The other people don't matter. Just his getting away and his needs are all that matters. It's what he says to Kemp. I needed it. So I had to take it. He was in my way. And that is the mental space that he's gotten into. So he's got his disguise... Oh, so this is like the first day of him being invisible, though, right? Yes. Or first couple of days? Yes. 
at any rate. And and already he's in the I needed it. Everyone else doesn't matter. Just my needs matter. It's setting him up as a well, selfish person. Yes, it is setting him up as a selfish person. It's just also explaining it a little bit is he's still trying to figure out how is he going to be able to explain to anybody I turned myself invisible. It, it's a very complex situation, so I could very much understand, especially in this time period where he's like, I don't care what happens to anybody else. I'm just doing well, not just that, you know, to how to me. appear normal, because he doesn't really want to explain that he turned himself invisible, because what if someone steals his work? Well, he and wants to get the credit for it still. I'm, I'm just like, if I were in that situation, like, I'm obviously not going to be able to explain that I've turned myself invisible. Like, it, people are going to freak out no matter what. We can and understand, yes, in the situation that needs must, we do what we must. That's why I think his conversation with Kemp is what sets him up on this sociopathic path, because even now, looking back, he doesn't care. And his inflection about it is all like, Shh, it's immaterial. Well, and so going into Star Wars a little bit, like people complaining that Luke doesn't take any time to grieve, it's because he just goes... And it's a nonstop thing for him for quite some time. Like, he goes with Ben. Ben, even though undetermined amount of time for them being on the Falcon to go to Alderaan, he, Ben keeps him busy training the entire time, keeps his mind busy. Then he gets to the Rebel base, and it's go fight. Or they end up on the Death Star, then, you know, series of events that keeps him from doing I'm just making that because it could be a similar that there's just this series of events and he hasn't taken the time to actually stop and think about anything too, which is just as scary. Yes. But even when he's had time to think about it, he still doesn't care. So he gets his costume and he gets his books and he starts getting his stuff, stealing money and whatnot, and eventually ends up at the inn. And then we're back with his conversation with Kemp and he says, I figured it out. The thing with invisibility, the only thing I've got to do is, he, he calls it a reign of terror. He says he needs to start his reign of terror and bring everyone under his power, make everyone afraid of him and make everything exactly the way he wants and get what he, he needs. But in order to do that, he needs a compatriot. And that's why he needs Kemp. Him and Kemp are going to do this and Kemp won't get caught. They'll never know he's involved. He just gets to, you know, own his hiding house so he has a place to sleep and eat while he terrorizes the world. Hmm. And Kemp is <clears throat> hemming and hawing and neither approving or disproving. He's just buying time this entire time for the constable to show up. So I think... So here at the end of the conversation, the constable does show up and Kemp tries to talk loudly to cover the sound of the constable coming into the house and coming upstairs. But Griffin hears him anyway and calls Kemp a traitor and he starts taking off his clothes to disappear. And Kemp tries to stop him and he's being strangled in his hallway when the constable comes up and beats him off. And he, Griffin, escapes and the constable makes sure Kemp's okay and Kemp says we need to catch him. We need to catch him because he is inhuman. He thinks nothing of his own advantage and his own safety. I've heard nothing this morning but of brutal self-seeking. He will kill them unless we can prevent them. He will create panic and nothing can stop him. Is what he says to the constable. Yeah. And then he explains um, all the things they have to do to catch him that he learned from Griffin's story. So he uses everything he learned from Griffin's story against him. He explained, you need to uh, sprinkle broken glass on all the roads to cut his feet so they'll bleed and leave footprints and we'll be able to see them even if he goes inside. And you need to get the dogs out because dogs can smell them. And you need to make sure everyone bars their doors and windows and doesn't open them unless they must and only this far. I know it's the 1890s, but I have a problem. Open glass on the ground, dogs running on it. I also have this problem. <laughs> they never, leave the dogs out. <laughs> they never m- mention the glass thing again. All right. I, like that it's actually done. <laughs> so find your 
self spot to. So they start the manhunt for him. Okay. Which is kind of where I end up. Uh, so the police are taking the Invisible Man story seriously now. Uh, we have a police search montage with a monologue of like police going around and just doing stuff. And then, or getting things ready. And then we have a dance that we enter into. And the music stops for an important radio broadcast. And then uh, it's talking about how there's this invisible man. We need all hands on deck, blah, blah, blah. And we get a police uh, people listening montage <laughs> and taking up arms to go help for the search. Some of them are. Some of them are just like <gasps> gasping in horror at how this could be. Um and then it goes back to the dance and the music starts again and people aren't dancing anymore. They're like leaving and going home or going to help with the search or whatever, which is actually like a really cool thing Yeah, that you have this dance that's interrupted with this. And then we go all around town and see everybody else reacting to it and then come back to the dance. I just, that's a neat thing. I just had to say that. <laughs> uh, then we get, uh, Kemp betraying Griffin and calling Science Dad to let him know that Griffin's there because you can't tell anybody, obviously. A little bit of what you were talking about there where he wants Kemp to help him, but it's kind of alluded to at this point. He's just like, I just want you to help me. We're friends, right? You can help me. You're brilliant like I am. And Flora. And then we have another montage of people calling the police. Montage the movie. <laughs> <laughs> and we see that Kemp is one of them. And Flora is insisting on going because I'm his fiance. I can reach him like none of you get like none of you men can. He won't hurt me. I could talk to him. I could get him to calm down and see things a different way. Sorry for the cat noise. And then we go down to or then we see Kemp again. And Griffin's pounding on the door. And he's like, what are you doing in here? Kemp's like, nothing. It just, you're, there's an invisible man in my house. And I don't know what you're going to do. And I'm scared. You can understand that, right? And then somebody shows up. And Griffin thinks it's the police. But it's Flora and Science Dad. And again, she's insisting that she can reach Griffin. And talk to him and stuff. And then Griffin reveals why he started his experiments because he's a poor man and he's in love with Flora and they're going to get married and he doesn't think he could take care of her. So he wanted this experiment to be his shining moment of uh, this was supposed to be his moment to make it big and start making money. And then he realized the implication of it and he can taste the power and he wants to sell it off to the highest government bidder and imagine an army of invisible men that can turn back visible when they're done. And that is a scary thought. Yeah. Like, I mean, it kind of touches on it a little bit, but it doesn't really. The psychology of it that we talk about in the interview portion. Kind of a little bit. I suppose it does touch on it a little bit, but it did, again, it doesn't really get too in depth with it. Then the police arrive, and Griffin knows that it was Kemp. Uh, and the police lock hands to play Red Rover, Red Rover, send Griffin right over. <laughs> and Griffin stripped back down, and he's gone to threaten Kemp. Griffin toys with the cops, slaps him around, throws him about a bit, takes one of their pants, and then he runs off to terrorize people. And we see one of the instances of this. He's got the cop's pants on. He puts them on. He's like, booga, 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 booga at this lady. And she's running because it's just a pair of pants running after her. <laughs> yeah, he like singing some weird song. 1930s mad people. Of course. <laughs> but it's funny. I actually kind of imagined him like that, even though he's invisible. <laughs> uh then we see the police interviewing Flora and Science Dad and Kemp. And Kemp is scared because uh, Griffin threatened to kill him at 10 o'clock the next day, 10 p.m. 
the next day and he's starting to be super paranoid and he's like uh, I think this is where he's like take me away and lock me up in a cage so that way he can't get to me and the police are like no 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 we got this dude we know what we're doing so then uh, we see that a search is going on for Griffin and he attacks some guy who's off on his own and throws him off a cliff and then people like come rushing and he's like oh you want some too and throws another one off the cliff and then cuts to the track control for the train because he said he wanted to crash the train and he attacks the guy and brains him but I think the assumption is that he kills him and he switches the rails to cause an accident and then he robs a bank and he throws the money into the streets and he sings kooky songs to show he's crazy and the then we come to the police inspector. They're trying to figure out what to do and be, they're being like serious now. And he says that he's killed 20 men in the search party and a hundred on the train. It's a pretty good kill count. And they're offering a 2000 pound reward. That's a lot of money for them. Should I just go ahead and finish mine and then? I guess. Ramble away. Um, so we got the police are clearing, clearing Kemp's house. They've got this big net and a whole bunch of them are holding it and they walk from one room to the other. It's clever. But Kemp's still paranoid and they lay out their plans. They're like, uh, I forget what the initial plan is, but he's like, no, 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 no. You got to do something more. You got to take me in and lock me in a cage. And the police chief's like, because they're going to walk him out and take him to the police station. Oh, no, they're going to take him to the police station and the idea is that Griffin's going to follow them and then they can snap him then. And he's like, no, you don't. You just want to use me as bait. I don't want to do that. He's still going to get me. He's like way more paranoid now because he knows what Griffin's capable of, I'm assuming. And so then they decide that they're going to dress him up like a policeman and go to the police station and then he come back and get his own car. And go away. Which is a little bit better plan, I guess. I guess. Rather than being in your own clothes, he's like, you be a policeman. He'll see you, but he won't see you. So it's kind of like you're invisible. <laughs> Pat on the head, little guy. <laughs> um, and then the police have all this other stuff. They've got paint and sprayers that they're going to spray. And they put loose gravel on the top of the wall. So in case he climbs over the wall and... They've got cops everywhere, and then there's a cat, and they spray, and they just look like fools. And then we see Kemp leaving in disguise as a cop, and he goes to the police station, and then he jumps on in another car, and they bring him back to his house. And he gets into his own car to escape, but Griffin is there. Gasp. And he tells him, you know, I was in the room when they said the plan. I followed you out. Followed you to the police station. I jumped on the car on the sideboard, came back to the house here, and I jumped in your car when you did. Dummy. And then they go out to a cliff, and he ties Kemp up. And then he uh, explains how Kemp's body is going to break, and all these horrible things are going to happen as he's falling down the cliff. And then he drives his car off the cliff, and it just blows up. <laughs> Like, it goes off the cliff and starts going down and then just explodes. <laughs> it's awesome. <laughs> um, then Griffin, proud of himself, he goes to a barn to rest. A uh, farmer comes in and hears him snoring, so then he goes to the police. and Or he goes to leave to the police. We go to the police and they're like, Ah, oh, by George, we're lucky. It's snowing outside now. We'll for sure be able to see him if he goes out. And then the farmer comes in. He's like, there's some weird breathing in my barn, guys. And they're like, oh, we don't know. But we can't take any chances. Because, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so the police go to the barn. And then decide they're going to smoke it out. And there's cops. Like, a solid wall of cops all the way around this thing. Must take place in or around London. So they're smoking Griffin out. And he comes out of the barn. And because of the fresh snow, they can see his footsteps. 
and they shoot him. Well, one cop shoots him. Because if all the cops shot him, other cops would get, hold on. And they say that he's not completely dead. He's in the hospital, but he is dying and he wants to see Flora before he dies. And they explain how because he's dying, the chemical's going to stop working. Not very well. They just It's just he's going to die and the chemical's going to stop working. So then we'll be able to see him. And there's some more really cool effects because it like kind of shows a skull and then like it's just slowly becomes this more um, opaque being. Yeah. And then you see his face. And now it's the end. My ending is a little bit different than yours. Just, I figured. Just a little bit. So Kemp's told the constable all he has to do. The dogs, the glass, don't let him eat, don't let him sleep, bar the doors, walk around in groups, swing sticks. So all the volunteers and townspeople, they're searching in groups. They've all got dogs and they're swinging sticks around as they walk looking for him. And Griffin's on the run. And while he's on the run, he comes across an old man and the man sees him and tries to fight him. But Griffin kills him. So then we cut back to Kemp's house and Kemp goes back to his house, you know, done their searching things. And he's taking a break or whatever. And a note slides under his door and he recognizes the handwriting. It's Griffin's. And it uh, says, I know what you did. You betrayed me. I'm going to make an example out of you. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to kill anyone who tries to help you. And he posts a note in the village square saying the same thing. I'm going to kill Kemp. If anyone helps him, I'm going to kill them too. So Kemp says, oh, this is perfect. I'll be the bait. And he writes a note to the constable and he has his maid run it down to the village and the constable comes and he knocks on his door and he says, uh, I was coming up here to check on you and your maid has been beaten and the note was taken from her. And Kemp goes, oh no, he knows, he knows the plan now. Such a fool I am. He, he knows the plan. So they've locked the house up and Griffin just starts smashing all the windows and trying to get in, but all the shutters are closed except for in one room because you can't shut the shutters in that room. Or maybe it's that way for trap. <laughs> That's what I would do. So he's smashing in the windows and uh, Kemp tells the constable, he says, go get more help. We'll work with it anyway. And the constable says, fine, give me your gun. You'll be safe in here. So he gets the gun and he sneaks out just through a little crack in the door so no one can come back in. And the constable's outside and he gets in a fight with Griffin and Griffin gets the gun. And he's holding the gun to him. And he says, get back in the house. I can't have you go into town for more help. I won't kill you if you just go back into the house and let me in so I can kill him. If you let me in so I can kill him, I won't kill you. So they go back up to the house because he's got the got the floating gun and he Kemp lets the constable back in and he sneaks in real fast and slams the door on him so he doesn't get back in. So they go to the, the broken door and Kemp's thrown the maid out the broken window so she can get away. And he sees the gun floating and tries to attack it. So he drops the gun to go be invisible again and try to get in. And somewhere in this madness, Kemp gets out the broken window too. Tries to go to the neighbor's house. The neighbor says, sorry. He says, if I don't help you, he won't kill me. So he keeps running toward town. Kemp does. While I think he also might, Griffin might have also shot the constable at this point. Yes, I think he also shot the constable at this point. So he's chasing him through town and he's yelling, you know, help me. He's banging on all the closed doors, but no one's going to help him because they'll get killed too. And so Griffin catches up to him and he's fighting him in the street and random laborer sees Kemp being held down and he comes up and he hits Griffin on the back of the head. And while he was being choked, the other villagers had come out to help. Yeah. Now that they've identified where Griffin's at and Kemp realizes that uh, he's now being helped. So he turns around and 
they all start fighting Griffin. And then they're beating him and they're holding him down. And uh, he stops breathing. And Kemp says, stop, stop, stop. He's dying or dead. And But don't let him go so you don't lose him. So they're holding his arms and his legs down as he slowly bleeds out and dies and becomes visible again. Huh. Maybe it was something in his blood in the book. Because he doesn't bleed in the movie. I don't know if that was... That's I was trying to look up uh, the code stuff. The pre-MPAA. And when... I think this was right before it came in because I think the code took effect in 1934. So I don't know how much that affected anything. Because um, like post-code was very... Like the... Uh, the code for the comic books. Yeah. How there were these very defined rules and the bad guys couldn't be too bad and you couldn't kill any good guys and stuff like that. Yeah. It was very, very similar to that. Kind of. But I'm wondering, like, how much of an impact that had and, you know, showing blood on screen in in movies, how acceptable that was at the time. Because I don't think it was. Because, like, even, even in the 60s, it was kind of looked down upon because you don't get a whole lot of blood in Psycho. Like, it's just blood going down a drain. So I wonder how much that affects the translation from the book to the movie. Because the book definitely sounds like it's a lot more intense. As far as, like, it could be a lot more intense. Could and be. I'm sure for the people at the time it was. Yeah, so that was the more direct comparison of the two. And you can see, like, there's a pretty Ow. decent deviation from the book to the movie that you're not able to why we gave it a fail because it just hit a point where it completely went on different tracks if you will <laughs> oh yeah you said he killed a bunch of people in trains and in the book the constable had closed down the trains that's why he wasn't able to get away ah. i forgot about that because you went on forever <laughs> well it just i was almost done and there wasn't really a decent stopping point for me and I knew you were going to be coming up on your finale. So, okay, I guess that's it. Uh, stay tuned. I said in the interview portion of this, um, uh, watching Invisible Man with the kids. And then next month for October, we're doing Haunting on of Hill House, Haunting on Hill House, something. Uh, for October, I'm going to be recording later with Ryan to start our other series of stuff where I talk with him about stuff. I don't know exactly what that's going to be. We shall see. Kind of a review. And talking about paranormal activity there also. Brian and I get done with paranormal activity. We'll break off and do some other stuff. Or maybe we'll do something different for October. I don't know. But yeah, toodles. <laughs>